Hi everyone in um, North America, Europe, Romania, and anywhere in the world. We are very, very pleased to be launching a broadcasting series of um, um, online um, original and exclusive content, one that moves part of our programming from the physical stages of uh, North America to our um, online and uh, internet um, uh, platforms. We um, are um, broadcasting in the following, uh, uh, following weeks uh, a series of um, exclusive um, concerts, talks, um, visual arts projects, uh, many other things that hopefully will transform a time of um, isolation and boredom into a time of uh, learning, discoveries, and joy. And we are very pleased to start this broadcasting series with the online version of uh, Leon Ferraru conferences, one of our permanent programs uh, that honors uh, the memory of um, writer, academic, diplomat uh, Leon Ferraru, former professor uh, of uh, Columbia University in the interwar uh, period, who is the true founder of professional cultural diplomacy of Romania in the United States. Leon Ferraro Conferences aims at uh, giving a voice to the solid, various, diverse um, Romanian expertise in all things American, and at uh, creating a platform for uh, transatlantic intellectual dialogue. The topic of the first um, online conversation of this series of, uh, of dialogues uh, that will unfold in the following, uh, in the following uh, weeks is uh, anti-Americanism. And we are happy to explore this complicated, elusive, uh, complex topic in the company of uh, Pan-Romania President uh, Radu Vancu, uh, writer, translator, academic, public intellectual, uh, author of more than 13 uh, books, widely translated throughout the world, a true star of Romanian cultural scene. Radu Vancu, thank you for accepting our invitation. Welcome to the program. Thank you for inviting me, Doru. I'm really proud and uh, happy to be here to talk to you on this topic and to try to transform this time of captivity, as you said, into a time of uh, maybe not felicity, but at least anti-boredom, so to speak. <laughs> exactly, you once deplored the disappearance of free time. Have these strange times uh, made up your mind? Well, I think uh, we, we all have this kind of illusion that we have a huge amount of free time nowadays, that these last, month or last few weeks are a huge quantity of free time which we can transform into whatever we want. But actually, I don't think it's free time. I think it's time of, it's captive time, so to say. It's, a, it's the opposite of free time. It's a, it's a huge amount of captive time with a very different quality than that of free time, which is very, very hard to process, very hard to transform into something you, you like, something you enjoy. We, we lack the gene of metabolizing captive time. Our brain is not made for these things. And now we are a captive planet trying to survive both physically and mentally. And this is why we can see one more time why art is so important. Because art helps us transform captive time into something manageable and maybe beautiful. When, we, uh, when I talked about uh, our Decameron for social media and for, for the internet uh, age, um, I was thinking, of course, of the, ta of the fact that these uh, people who are, of course, isolating themselves from the, from the ravages of the, of the plague uh, are, um, are um, uh, discovering the redemptive powers of uh, art and culture. And probably that's what we are trying to do with this uh, series of online uh, conversations. 
um, you, the topic of course is uh, an, um, Americanism and anti-Americanism. Uh, and um, um, you are the translator of two major uh, poets, Ezra Pound and John Berryman. Um, both had a very complicated relationship with the United States, with the American culture, with the American uh, way of life. Um, amazing, uh, amazing tutors, amazing mentors in all things uh, American. Why did you, what did you learn from them? Well, uh, let's take them one by one. Um, Ezra Pound, on the one hand, has this huge curiosity, this huge uh, um, energy of investing time and passion into discovering other cultures, other poetries, other languages, translating from Chinese, from Japanese, from uh, Greek, from uh, Provencal, from Italian, from French. So uh, he has this conviction that beauty is a flame. It's, these are his exact words. Beauty is a flame which was set in Provence, in the ancient Greece, uh, in the ancient Greek mysteries, then has passed on to the Latins, to the Romans, and from there to the Italians, to Dante, and so on, to modern times. And what the poet has to do is to rekindle this flame of beauty and to make it new. So I think this is very American. This interest in other cultures, other languages, in taking beauty from all world scenes and try to make it new and to maybe to appropriate it, to transform it into something very um, uh, powerful and in the same time very keen to your own identity. Mm -hmm. This is very American. This is what, this is his American side. He has this anti-American side in the same time, his, okay. which is his hubris. His, both have this side as well. Yeah, exactly. He has, he has the both faces of the coin. Uh, uh, the anti-American is his misjudgment of America. Because uh, when he became an anti-American and spoke from Radio Rome uh, uh, in the favor of Mussolini, uh, um, he lacked the understanding of what America, that, the, that uh, America, you, the United States were on the good side of history. And they were fighting for freedom while he thought freedom was something secondary. That was what he missed from the American, from the main American lesson. This disparagement, this uh, understanding of freedom as something secondary. And this was his, this is what is unpardonable from his side. Mm -hmm. So he can teach you two major lessons, what to do and what not to do. What to, I mean, follow his energy and passion for the beauty and for the alterity of beauty. But in the same time, never forget that freedom is the main thing. And any other values which try to replace freedom uh, are leading you to something very wrong and uh, unacceptable. And John Berryman, um, he also had a complicated relation with America, but not he has never it's been anti-American. I should say. <laughs> A very but tormented individual. He was he was tormented. He was deeply troubled by the suicide of his father when he was eighteen. When he was eleven, sorry, his father committed suicide, and he was uh, at home. I mean, John Berryman, the, the child at uh, the time, so he witnessed the the suicide, uh, which left him very troubled and traumatized. He grew up with that trauma and tried to transform it into, in order to cope with it, to transform it into beauty. And he managed to do it until he was 57, and then he committed suicide himself. He, he failed in, in uh, managing the trauma to the very end. But he created hundreds of beautiful poems out of it. So this is the first lesson from John Barry. How to transform trauma into beauty. The second lesson is uh, how to work. In one of his last interviews, televised interviews, he was asked by the interviewer, Mr. Berryman, what would you like people to remember about you when you're gone? And he said without hesitating, he said that I worked hard. So his was a life of hard working, of passion and hard work transformed into, into beauty. And this is, I think, his lesson. Yeah. 
And I think it's a very American uh, American lesson. And it's also very American. You're right. So I should say by, that by um, uh, by knowing these two huge authors, very important authors, so uh, so well, with all this um, ambivalence about their um, uh, relationship towards America, you are quite well equipped to understand a lot from uh, from these uh, civilizations, for this civilization, this uh, society. And now I'll um, start with um, uh, a question that is uh, directly related to our uh, topic. Uh, research shows that uh, Romania is one of the most pro-American country in Europe and indeed in, in the world. Uh, do you buy it? Uh, why do you see that is? Yeah, I do buy it. I think it's very true. I, I've seen some surveys in the last decades, in the last two decades, and they show a very consistent pro-Americanism uh, in Romania, which was not always the case from the beginnings of our culture. I, I, I remember some texts, some articles by Mihai Eminescu, our romantic poet, our national poet. He was very anti-American. I was surprised to see that. He wrote, literally, he said, we, the young Romanian kingdom, should take care not to become the America of the East which is so so funny actually because this that's what we would dream now to be a sort of uh, america of the east you know i mean with this strategic pact we have with the us we are a sort of uh, american stronghold in the uh, in the eastern europe that's well right. uh, i mean this was yeah yeah exactly yeah so also in the interwar period uh, we are not anti american but we were not also we were neutral indifferent to to the united states culturally speaking our model was Paris. Uh, all Romanian writers emulated and uh, competed with French writers. The, those are our models. So I think we have become pro, so pro-American under communism. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's explainable because we were prisoners uh, in a political regime which denied freedom and uh, individual rights. And on the other hand, the land of freedom and of support for individual rights was uh, the United States, which were fighting communism in the Cold War. So it, it was natural to, to go that way, natural to see in, in the US the model. And it also reminds me that uh, Tocqueville, uh, when he visited America in the 1840s, I mean, exactly in the 1840, he wrote this sentence, he said, uh, the United States do not have their own poetry so far, but they will have it very soon. And it's not going to be a poetry of nature because we Europeans have done that already. It's not going to be a poetry of history because we Europeans have done it already. It's going to be a poetry of the individual self. It's, these are Tocqueville's words. He said, America is the continent and the culture of the individual. And they will make a very powerful literature of the individual. And I think this is why we looked so desperately and so hopeful towards America. It was a culture of the individual, and we did not want to let ourselves be crushed by an anti-individualistic culture as communist culture was. This is, I think, also the reason why we are today so pro-American. It's the only option when you know that Russia is so close, you know what communism was, your only option is to be pro-American with all your uh, heart, because those are the values we are striving for. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, and uh, indeed uh, the research shows that the levels of, um, uh, of uh, the positive sentiments uh, towards America are quite, uh, quite prevalent. But still, as you, as you said, there is um, residual, uh, I don't know how, um, how dangerous it is of anti-Americanism. Uh, where, do you, where do you see it in our society and how would you describe it? Uh, well, roughly speaking, I think there are two extreme sides of the political spectrum that are anti-American, the far right and the far left, for, for different reasons. The far left is anti-American because it's pro-Russian. It's simple. Uh, they see in Russia or maybe in China the model, and then they feel natural. They, they feel that their natural enemy is the United States. For the far right, um, 
uh, America is the land of uh, oppressive political correctness, so to say. Mm -hmm. They see in political correctness uh, the, the natural enemy. And this is why they uh, oppose uh, uh, the United States, uh, because they feel that individual rights may be uh, threatened or maybe even abolished by a very abusive political correctness, which sometimes it happens. I mean, we can find lots of examples of uh, things gone wrong because of excessive understanding of political correctness, but I don't think that's the enemy. I think, uh, as anything, if it's done, if it's gone to the extremes, uh, it becomes dangerous. Uh, any good idea, I mean, uh, all totalitarianisms sound, sound good in the first place. They promise equality, they promise uh, different utopias, uh, and in the end, they can they fail if they are, when they are taken to the extremes. That's what happened with all ideologies, political correctness included. Uh, and there is also some, maybe some sort of anti-Americanism due to anti-Trumpism also. So there, there, may, there may be people who confuse uh, US with President Trump and they may, may resent President Trump and then they think they are anti-American. So I think these are the two or three sources of uh, anti, uh, residual anti-Americanism as you, as you said, but um, I don't see it as a threat. It's, it's less than 10% in the overall political spectrum so and i don't think i don't think it will grow uh that's why i think it's also well correlated to the pro-european stance of our uh, um of, of romanians and uh and also you know for for many many years both uh, figures have been uh, very high unusual high uh, in comparison to other countries where the anti-European or anti-American sentiment um, run quite, um, quite, uh, quite high. Uh, but um, do you see an, uh, an intellectual tradition in Romania of uh, anti-Americanism? Uh, let's say ideas coming from the French tradition of anti-Americanism or the German tradition of anti-Americanism, which is quite strong and quite philosophical, or is uh, only related to the sources that you were uh, mentioning, connection to other uh, countries or the confusion between the, uh, pres the current president and uh, the country, uh, country itself? Uh. I don't think we, we have this kind of philosophical anti-Americanism uh, because uh, it has developed in countries with a, with a strong democratic tradition, which uh, are very stable, which are not menaced uh, or are not under threat by any abusive uh, power. And they can, they can afford being anti-American philosophically, so to say. Yeah. But if you look at the overall picture in Eastern Europe, you will see that Poland is very pro-American, that uh, Romania is pro-American, the Baltic states are pro-American. So exactly. all cultures bordering Russia are for the very same reason pro-American because they, they don't afford losing the individual rights and freedom once again. And they know that the US is a natural ally in this. So we don't have time, we don't have the luxury of being philosophically anti-American when we need it, we need the U.S. support in order to resist and to uh, to stay free in front of the uh, of this threat, which is very real, of uh, losing freedom, losing um, losing autonomy, and losing everything that makes your democratic security, state. Because let's not forget the security the exactly. that, uh, that the so, partnership with the United States provides. I, I'd say. I even say that we we have we biologically have to be pro-American because it's for the survival, for the physical survival of this country and of your own culture. And of course, if uh, you live in France, in Germany, maybe in the UK, you can also have different thoughts about being anti-American, stemming, originating in some understanding of the left versus uh, uh, American republicanism or something which is nuanced and it's worth discussing but uh, when you're under under this real threat which has historically been proven uh, you don't have this luxury uh, 
your option for freedom goes with the United States. Um, ours and others for, for sure. I would like to expand the conversation a little bit uh, the, and uh, going, uh, and getting out of Romania, so to speak, to at the, at the European level, where situation and uh, the and anti-Americanism as a um, philosophical notion, as a, um, a political, um, political position, and as an in intellectual tradition, uh, are quite uh, quite strong um, because you mentioned Tocqueville, and I think all serious conversation about the United States should <laughs> somehow involve um, this great uh, thinker, perennial thinker. Um, sometimes uh, the, I mean, for for many, uh, the United States embodies the uh, idea of modernity political modernity, social modernity, um, economic modernity, uh, obviously capitalism. Uh, does it mean that anti-Americanism is a form of rejecting modernity, of, uh, um, of, of a way to try to uh, oppose the um, so far irresistible march of modernity? Uh, it depends on on your reason for being anti-American. If, if uh, you're anti-American because you're pro-totalitarian, pro-Russian, pro-Chinese and so on, yeah, I think it can mean that you, you oppose modernity. If you understand modernity as uh, uh, individual rights and everything coming with it, the respect for the individual, for private property, for the legal network surrounding the property and so on, it means that you reject modernity indeed. Uh, if you are anti-American because you think uh, globalism is American and globalism is something uh, generally bad and uh, something that should be rejected or corrected, then you are not necessarily anti-modern. Uh, you may reject globalism because you could think that uh, uh, it threatens minor cultures, that uh, it threatens... Uh, capital things about humanity which have developed in other... That's right, or local way of life. And uh, Exactly. Yeah. If you think globalism is destructive for the diversity of the world and you are trying to correct something into globalism which should preserve these local cultures and the richness and variety of the world, you're not anti-modern. You are trying to invent maybe a new form of modernity which to to correct uh, the excesses of globalism. And, but I, I don't think that that should be named anti-Americanism. It, it could be named anti-globalism. It could be named some anti-capitalism maybe, who knows, but not necessarily anti-Americanism. Even though in many respects, uh, the, uh, the world order and this way of life and the American popular culture, there are some, often associated with, um, with globalism and criticized as such uh, springs from, uh, from, uh, from the United States, from this soil. Yeah. There is this one book of Steven Pinker's, uh, Enlightenment Now, which has been published, I think, uh, last year. Uh, and uh, Pinker shows there with statistics and graphs and so on, that globalism actually is a, a huge benefit for the planet. It, it has increased in, in three decades, it, it has increased with uh, almost 30% the uh, level of uh, extreme poverty in the world, which is something that cannot be denied. And so, so there are huge advantages of globalism. There are, of course, excesses which have to be corrected. But um, if you identify yourself as anti-American, because you are uh, anti-globalist, yeah. I think you are putting a wrong label on yourself, and we, which it, it is not a very uh, noble label, so to say. I think you are you are making a uh, discredit, and uh, you are not servicing well your cause. You should say, "I don't like globalism. I think it can be corrected. I think it can it does excesses which have to be corrected, and they they can be corrected in this." specific ways. And then you are a partner of dialogue. But I cannot have a partner of dialogue in somebody who is pro-totalitarian, so to say. Of course. 
Uh, you you have been uh, quite preoccupied with this um, notion of post-humanism. Uh, it's um, it is like um, like um, a trace, a silver lining uh, through your latest um, writings. Do you think that uh, post-humanism, because the United States is uh, the um, is in the avant-garde of uh, technology of uh, um, artificial intelligence of uh, all sorts of uh, these recent discoveries. Uh, do you think that um, post-humanism uh, can become also a source of uh, uh, anti-Americanism anti -Americanism for those who for some reason uh, would um, reject uh, these uh, discoveries in technology or fear them as something profoundly in, uh, unhuman, inhuman, inhumane, uh, all, these, uh, all these categories against, uh, against uh, a, a basic uh, fundamental definition of the human. There are, I think, two families of uh, post-humanist thinkers. Uh, one of them which unfortunately is the more uh, numerous, is those uh, who understand anti uh, post-humanism as a uh, revanche against the humanism. Mm -hmm. So for them, post-humanism is, uh, is a form of anti-humanism, so to say. Uh, they blame the human as a concept uh, for uh, all the misdeeds of modernity. Uh, they think uh, communism, fascism, na Nazism, everything Wrong, everything gone wrong with uh, humanity in the modern times is, the, is due to a wrong understanding or wrong definition of the human. So they are post-human as anti-human. And then there is another family of thinkers. And in my mind comes first uh, Rosie Braidotti, the professor of uh, Utrecht University. And she writes that uh, for her, post-humanism uh, should be understood as a way of preserving into post-human times when humans are hybridated with artificial intelligence, with all kinds of uh, uh, cybernetic prosthetics and so on. Mm -hmm. She writes that in these times, we should preserve the old human humanistic values of empathy and attention to the others. Yeah. And I'll, this I'll is the post-humanism. Exactly, yeah. So uh, uh, she has this wonderful book, the, the final chapter, the third chapter, which is the final chapter, is, has the title um, Post-Humanism as, um, uh, as Late Pro-Humanism, something like that. So uh, uh, transforming post-human era into a preservation of good old uh, human values. So, if you understand post-humanism that way, uh, and you identify it, identify it with the, the US, I think this cannot turn you into an anti-American. Yeah. But if you see post-humanism as a revenge, as a revenge against uh, humanism, and you identify it with the US, if you identify the siege, the headquarters of post-humanism with the United States, this may turn somebody who knows into a uh, anti-American, but again, he's not right because most of the post-human philosophers do not come necessarily from the US. They come from Europe, from Australia, uh, some of them from the US also, but US is not the, the basis and the headquarters of the post-humanist thought. Uh, I think we should have, uh, maybe should have started by um, reminding that anti-Americanism more than being a, um, a sort of um, um, rational, uh, very well articulated doctrine is in fact um, more or less a bundle of emotions, very often uh, irrational, that, um, that sees all these emotions that see uh, uh, in the United States, project in the United States, every, all evil, uh, and um, most of the time, uh, 
or, or old ways without any proof or with fabricated, uh, fabricated proof. Um, it's a sort of irrational rejection of all things uh, uh, American, while sometimes even professing a sort of sympathy for, I don't know, from time to time to the American people or uh, some aspects of American, uh, American life. But the element of irrationality the element of mindlessness uh, is uh, probably always there. And I think this is very much related to what you say about this post-humanist, about this position that we need to continue to be empathic. We need to continue to, to retain those values that probably define us more than, uh, than others. And also, um, as some um, thinkers say, abandon some of the things that have uh, made us uh, become uh, the uh, terrible origins of so many uh, so many tragedies. Uh, going back to um, sort of anti-Americanism and more sometimes criticism, we often hear that um, look, you know, America doesn't have any history. It's the, the American people does not exist. It's sort of collection of uh, of uh, individuals. This is one of the recurrent uh, criticism. What do you make of it? Uh, well, I think culture and tradition is sometimes not what you make of your own culture and tradition. It's what you make of some, some other uh, cultures and traditions which are not necessarily yours. There is this famous book published two decades ago by the French philosopher Rémy Brague. It's called uh, Europe uh, la Voix Romaine, Europe the Roman Culture. And it aims at the definition of Europe. And uh, Brague, he says there that uh, being European means to be attentive to something which is exterior to your own culture, to take it, to metabolize it, and to transform it into your own identity. He calls this secondarity. And he gives the example of the Greek culture and the Roman culture. So the Roman culture, even though they defeated the Greeks, they take their culture, their mythology, even their religion, and they transform it into their own. Uh, they make the Greek writers uh, the models with, with which their own writers have to emulate. Virgil has to emulate with Homer in order to prove that he's a worthy writer. Uh, Catullus has to emulate and to compete with Sappho in order to prove that he's a good erotic poet and so on. We, so they have transformed Roman culture into their own culture. Christianity, Bragg shows again, is born in a non-European space, in non-European languages, and it's transformed into the backbone of Europe. So uh, I think the United States, the American culture is very European if you, if you want in this respect. In this they respect. look to other cultures uh, and they, they are very curious to discover other cultures and transform these cultures into their own identity. It's what also Romanian culture has done. Think about, you know, the, 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 the wonderful uh, Timisoara poet, Sherban Forza. He has this saying, this paradox. He says, Mihai Minescu is a wonderful German, German poet of Romanian language. And it sounds like a paradox, but it's so true. Uh, Eminescu's models were German. He competed with Jean Paul, with Hölderlin, with uh, Novalis, and he, he transformed German culture into something very Romanian. Blaga had, has done the same thing with German culture. Uh, Arghese with French poetry, Mircea Ivanescu with Anglo Saxon, right. American and British poetry, and so on. So if you look to other cultures, borrow from them, metabolize them, and you transform it into your own culture. You have a tradition, you have a huge tradition. Jon Barbu, the wonderful Romanian poet, said that he, he was a Greek poet because he felt contemporary with Pindarus. And this is what America does also. It looks to other cultures and enriches its own DNA uh, with this uh, material and transforms it into something very American. So even though it has, let's say, a few hundred years of uh, tradition, it goes back, I mean, Pound is a huge American poet. His contemporary, he has borrowed, he has borrowed from Chinese, ancient Chinese poetry, ancient Japanese poetry, uh, ancient Greek poetry, and has transformed it into American culture. So I dare say that American culture is 
as old and as ancient as Chinese and Greek and uh, Japanese culture. I, uh, uh, I, I've always found uh, myself uh, the, the notion that, is, uh, that America is so new and uh, without history quite uh, quite striking uh, quite striking because the facts you know are simply not there uh, there is a, as you know uh, you all know so well uh, um, histories that show that there is a, a very important uh, indigenous uh, history uh, quite overlooked for quite some time but now uh, read, uh, rediscovered the colonial history is quite rich and complex and uh, and, uh, and interesting, and of course, the proper history of the United States with so many things, uh, including civil wars, including uh, all sorts of um, um, catastrophes and triumphs um, that um, definitely make um, a great and rich history and quite, uh, quite old uh, by now. But there is also a um, thing, I think, a utopian element in the American identity, in the American uh, perception of uh, its own self uh, that is um, uh, related to this idea of the city on the hill, of this uh, new world uh, where everything will be different, where uh, you know, all possibilities open in front of the ambitious, hardworking, generous, and, uh, and, uh, and diligent um, um, men and women. Uh, so uh, do you think that the United States uh, have lived up to this um, uh, utopian element? Maybe not so utopian, that there is, um, there is an accord between this ideal and the current reality? Well, uh, yeah, it's a tough question. Uh, actually, of course, uh, any utopia is a failed utopia, whatever you make of it. But uh, let's look at what, uh, what Russia has done with the communist utopia. And let's look at what uh, Germans have done with the fascist utopia. And look what uh, America has done uh, with a capitalist utopia. And you, you can measure the results. So America, it, it, it's an imperfect country like any other countries. You can find thousands maybe of examples of uh, which are revolting. But still, uh, following this American dream, this utopia, this utopia of the individual who succeeds by his own forces if he works hard and she is honest and so and she fights uh, with honest uh, means and so on and you can see that they have managed to build a land of prosperity a land which preserves individual rights and uh, a land which uh, which looks more like the promised land than any other utopias that have ever marched uh, the earth so i think uh, so to summarize if you judge this utopia, uh, according with the original utopia, I'm sure you can find many flaws. If you judge it by comparison with the other utopias, which were all tragically failed, I think you, you can say, OK, this is the utopia I would like to live in. Well, I, uh, I don't think, I mean, I, I think this is only one aspect of the American civilization. You know, there is this utopian string, as there is a utopian string in every uh, in every culture and in every uh, civilization, so I personally don't think there is, a, there is this is a utopian, uh, utopian country. Of course, there are ideals and um, some of them are fulfilled, some of them are still waiting uh, to be fulfilled, like probably anywhere in this imperfect world that we are, uh, that we are in, uh, inhabiting. I, um, uh, let's take um, let's take a short uh, a short break and then we come back with the conversation the last segment of our conversation about the American impact on uh, Romania.
and welcome back. Um, I would, um, I would uh, start this last segment of our conversation uh, with the impact of the American literature uh, on, the, uh, on the, our literature. There have been uh, quite a few Romanian authors that have uh, claimed, have professed uh, clear influences uh, coming from, uh, uh, from American authors in poetry as well as um, uh, fiction. Uh, let's talk a, li a little bit about this uh, literary influence. When do you see it stronger? What are, uh, how would you describe it? Where, what are the names uh, that come to your mind when thinking of this um, significant uh, impact? I think it's an influence which has no more than uh, half a century of uh, tradition. So about 50, maybe 60 years ago, uh, Mircea Ivanescu was the first major Romanian writer to turn towards uh, American uh, models and uh, the American understanding of poetry. Until then, uh, the models of Romanian literature were either French or German. It was the tension between the French model and the German model. And this is why, for example, when uh, Lucian Blaga wrote about the models of Romanian culture, uh, he identified these two types of catalytic model or um, influential model, uh, modulating model um, of uh, the French one. So Mircea Ivanescu in about 1960 started writing uh, in the colloquial manner and in the day-to-day -day and natural tone of uh, American poets about a concrete person living in a concrete world with concrete questions and uh, he did not have this kind of representing the, the writer as uh, some very wise guy with access to transcendental truths who revelates them out of his uh, magnanimity to uh, a lesser reader. So until then, the, the, the relation of the writer with the reader was asymmetrical. The writer was the revelator, the prophet, and the reader was the believer. So Ivanescu comes with this democratic American understanding. I, the writer, am a concrete person like you, living in the same world with you, having the same problems with you, and I'd like to write poems or literature which tackles these issues and let's talk to, together about them. This was happening in Romanian communism, which disliked very strongly this American influence because um, uh, the communist regime was quite okay with writers writing about non-worldly problems, writing about uh, transcendental things and visions and so on, but anything to avoid the real day-to-day -day life because this is very problematic. Telling because it involves telling the truth about the world you live in. And uh, Ivanescu was quite misunderstood in his, uh, in his generation. Uh, some critics, some major critics wrote, wrote very highly about him. Matei Kalinescu, uh, Ion Negoicescu, Grigurcu, uh, wrote very highly and understanding about him, but he was not quite successful, actually. But in the next generation, Mircea Cărtărescu's generation, the generation of the uh, 80s, he became, he became very influential because these young guys in the 80s refused evasionism, refused talking about transcendental truths and uh, realms. They wanted to talk about the hic et nunc, about the here and now of, uh, of life. And they found in Ivanescu a predecessor. And they also searched for Ivanescu's sources, and they started writing, re reading American literature. Uh, as you know, Cărtărescu is very fond of Thomas Pynchon, and uh, uh, Romanian poets were very fond of John Berryman, of, of the Beatniks, of the Beat Generation, of Ginsberg, Ferlinghetti, Corso, and so on. So they used American literature, American postmodernism mainly, as a corpus of political resistance against, against the regime, which was quite different than the strictly aesthetic understanding of postmodernism that was happening in, uh, in the US actually. So they, they transformed postmodern uh, aesthetics 
into a very powerful political tool against the oppressive communist regime. And now, uh, after communism collapsed, America, American literature still remained probably the most influential corpus of, uh, of um, literary influences uh, in uh, Romanian literature because post-communism was also very complicated because you had to find some, some tools where aesthetics and ethics and politics coalesce and merge. And uh, I think this is what American literature can teach you. So, so do you see the influence more powerfully in poetry rather than uh, fiction, right? It started in poetry. It started with Mircea Ivonescu in poetry. It started with uh, uh, the... Which uh, of course now is a huge name, right? I mean, <laughs> no doubt in, in the 70s probably, but with starting with the 80s and now 90s and, and later uh, Ivonescu is one of the recognized as such, one of the big names of our post-war uh, poetry. Uh, Alexandru Cistelecan, who probably is the, together with Ion Pop, uh, the best poetry critic uh, of the last decades, wrote that Ivanescu is the most influential Romanian poet after World War II, because he changed the understanding of poetry. He was the first in our literature to, 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 to say that the writer should be a concrete person, as I said, writing about concrete problems. And uh, disregarding the huge differences in Romanian poetics nowadays, we all write about concrete persons in a concrete world, dealing with concrete issues and so on. So this is why he's so influential. He, he, he changed the whole understanding of literature. And it happened and first in poetry. To write poetry, right? What poetry can be. Yeah, I mean, he was a, a, a colleague of generation with Nikita Stanescu. They were good friends for, for six or seven months. They were best friends. And Ivanescu oh, said in his... <laughs> uh, Ivanescu said in his wonderful conversation with uh, Gabriel Liciano, they, they wrote a book of conversations. Uh, and he said, well, I went with Nikita Stanescu, my friend, in pubs and bars, and we drank together and we talked. And uh, I knew what Nikita was interested in, in what his life was made of. And then we started writing poems. And Nikita, much to my surprise, even as we said, wrote about angels, about meeting angels and talking to them and so on. And I knew as a fact that he has never met any angel, he said. And uh, I, I, could, I could never lie in poetry, Ivanescu said. I wanted to write about real things in life, not about angels. So uh, this is what he has taught us all, to write about real things in life. Uh, I don't want to, to, to imply that uh, Nikita Stanescu is not a wonderful poet himself, but he's, he's, he's an evasionist poet, and the model now is of uh, an immanent poet, writing about now and here. And this is what Ivonescu has taught us all to, to do. It's, um, I, I'd like to, um, uh, to uh, leave a little bit um, literature aside and go to popular culture. How influential was American popular culture on you, for instance? Uh, of course, all our generations and, you know, before us and after us. Um, American popular culture was... I should say, uh, decisive in, uh, uh, in many respects. How was it for you? Uh, so I'd uh, answer first with the memories from, um, from my communist childhood. When American objects and American things which uh, ca came from uh, popular culture was so rare and they were transformed into into objects of, in, of cult, so to say. So an, an, an empty can of Coca-Cola was placed as a sort of rare jewelry, you know. In all living rooms. <laughs> so, sort of totem, yeah, in, in Romanian living rooms. It, it was rare, it came, it, it came from the land of the free and it was more than popular culture actually. It represented freedom. Then after 1990, uh, American movies, American music uh, became extremely popular and they, I think they were one of the major influences in, uh, in literature and in arts. 
uh, not only in uh, Romania. Think of uh, Emir Kusturica's movies. Think of um, Serbian, Hungarian, uh, Belatar's movies, and so on. Uh, American popular culture be became the universal lingua franca of us all. It uh, represented uh, uh, the, the basic values with, of our language, of our universal language. And this is why the, there is such a um, family air, family atmosphere uh, in, uh, if you read poetry from uh, 2010, let's say, or 2020, and po Romanian poetry from 1980s, they, they share these uh, references to popular culture. Uh, it's the uh, zeitgeist, it's the seculum as Tacitus named it. It's, uh, it's the air of the time transformed into, into an aesthetic object. So it's really powerful and influential. Not to mention, of course, uh, music, which is so pervasive and uh, means so much for, uh, for all of us. And also um, uh, um, something that unites very much the 80s generation and later generations, not only the way they write poetry, or you write poetry, but also what you listen, you know, some of the, the, the musical references, you know, some of the great, uh, the great uh, the bands and, uh, and musicians coming from the United States. Of course, cinema as well, um, uh, which uh, have been so important. Um, starting from 70s, uh, 80s. It, 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 was, it was seen very political in this side of the Iron Curtain. Remember about the huge concert with the wall, uh, Pink Floyd, yeah? Which was uh, a landmark, for, or the concert in Moscow of Metallica in 1991, if I'm correct, yeah? So it was, uh, rock music was seen as the language of, uh, of freedom. It was more than rock music. It was more than popular culture. And if we understand by popular culture, also social media and what happens now with Facebook and everything, which also comes from the US, it has transformed immensely the, the way of thought of younger artists. So uh, uh, I say often that me and you, we come from the Gutenberg galaxy, right? So our brain, our thought is modeled on the producing of texts syllogistic texts, syllogistic sentences following each other and uh, in a demonstrative way and uh, transforming into a printed page. Contemporary generations come from the, from the Zuckerberg galaxy. I mean, uh, it, it's, uh, it's something which combines text and image and uh, movies and uh, it's, their thinking is more producing video clips, if you say, not texts. I mean, something which uh, coalesces, which uh, hybridates text, image, music, and you can see it in their poems. Uh, their poems are video clips, are not uh, demonstrative texts anymore. So it's it's really interesting. So popular culture has transformed radically also the uh, thinking process, the thought, the human thought. Before we, we take the last uh, question, I'd like to uh, remind all our viewers that all these uh, broadcastings are uh, dedicated to the doctors, nurses, medical personnel, uh, essential workers, especially to um, Romanian Americans and Romanian Canadians here in uh, North America. Uh, you are doing a wonderful job. We admire your courage and uh, we uh, celebrate and applaud your uh, determination and your uh, hard work. Um, everything we do is, of course, um, dedicated to, to, to you and uh, we can't wait to have, uh, to have you as guests at the Romanian Cultural Institute when uh, we get out of uh, isolation and uh, social distancing. And now I, uh, I'd like to... Um, uh, to get to the um, to the the last question, uh, which is related to the the transatlantic partnership, it's uh, one of the most important, if not the most important, anchor in terms of uh, uh, security, international uh, international relations. How how do you uh, how do you see it? 
I think I can only state the obvious and say that uh, uh, it's a uh, it's more than a must. It's a condition for the survival of uh, Western culture and the West, more than, even more than Western culture, the Western world as we see it. So uh, any isolation between the two sides of the Atlantic would be suicidal. Uh, of course, first of all, because the world has globalized. And second of all, because uh, uh, this kind of uh, culture, which we take as granted with the individual rights, with uh, uh, this legal network of protect protecting the individual, the free market, uh, and then it's everything it produces, it's not for granted, actually. It's something that has been fought for, has been, I don't want to be melodramatic, but it has been died for. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, it's something which is also fragile. It can disappear in a second. We are living in the middle of a pandemia right now. Okay, we are living in a sci-fi movie. So if two months ago, some, 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 anybody would have said, uh, look, we'll stay closed in our in our homes, and we will be we will not be allowed anymore to go on the streets and circulate and so on, and we'll communicate uh, exclusively exclusively via uh, Facebook, Zoom, and so on. Uh, it would have seemed a dystopia. So civilization is so fragile. Uh, just imagine a shortage of uh, bread, of uh, something which can disappear. It's not. Uh, the, the daily life is not uh, something. Maybe water, for that matter. Water, water, even worse. Yeah, much worse. So, um, what what I'm trying to say is that, you know, Max Weber has a wonderful definition of a nation, and I think it's now also a wonderful definition of a transnational world. He says, a nation is a community of memory and feeling. So. Uh, we have strived for, for once, more than one century, to build this community of memory and feeling on both sides of the Atlantic. It works very well with its flaws and its inherent vices and so on, but it works. And it can disappear if we allow the network of feeling and of memory to disintegrate, things will collapse even worse than in this pandemic. We have to stick to this community of memory and feeling and make, make it work for at least one or two generation, generations, just as we have received it from our predecessors. Uh, I think it's the right, uh, the right tone and the right idea to uh, finish our, uh, our quite long uh, conversation. I hope our viewers are not, uh, are not uh, bored uh, by um, by it and they should and because I think it was a, a very uh, a very interesting uh, uh, a very interesting change. I'd like to uh, remind our viewers also about um, the, what's happening next uh, in our broadcasting uh, series. Uh, don't miss uh, um, Daniel Ropota's uh, exclusive recital tomorrow evening at uh, seven pm uh, seven pm. Um, East Coast time. Um, Daniel Ropota is a Manchester-based uh, young Romanian pianist, a formidable uh, pianist, extraordinary pianist. And like everything we do during these times, the content is uh, exclusively made for uh, our, um, our platforms. So there isn't any other place you can uh, enjoy this, uh, this wonderful, uh, wonderful musician. Uh, and also we will uh, have as the next guest of the Leon Ferraru uh, conferences, the famous historian, uh, professor, British uh, historian and professor Dennis Delatant, with a conversation about uh, Nicolae Ceausescu's uh, secret police in uh, North America, Securitatis operations in um, North uh, America. Uh, but before we say goodbye, I'd like to uh, thank Radu Vanku for this uh, uh, brilliant uh, exchange, for accepting to spend some time with us and, uh, and uh, our viewers. And also to thank you for your patience, uh, for your interest. Uh, and uh, before we go, we'd like from the, from the part of the Romanian Cultural Institute to wish you all um, 
stay safe and um, stay um, in touch as much as you can. Thank you.